So how are you doing today? Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, took us a little while to get the Zoom call working, but after a few uh, updates, we got it going. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> uh, we're actually in the pandemic period as well in Istanbul, in Turkey. Uh, there, there's four days of completely lockdown uh, for the weekend and Monday and Tuesday. And they do completely lockdown during the weekends. Uh, during, the, during the week, just essential works are open now. Wait, you said 11. four days? Four days of lockdown, but it's been uh, more than like uh, 65 days. Everyone is at home. So during the 65 days, uh, just essential works, like uh, very, very essential works just were working. But uh, at the weekends, everywhere was just in lockdown. You can't go outside. You can't jo go even for like uh, shopping or like essential uh, things. There's no, there's nowhere open. So this week, uh, previous week, sorry, 11th, 11th May, they opened the essential markets and a, a little bit of like uh, barber shops, these kind of stuff. And uh, I think it's getting better in here. The situation is getting better. The numbers are going down. The curve is going to be flattened, and etc. How's how's everything going in the U.S.? You're from New Jersey, right? Yeah, I'm from New Jersey. It's similar here. Um, we don't have a four-day uh, more serious lockdown going on right now. It, things are starting to slowly open up. Some, uh, I believe some restaurants will be able to operate at 25% capacity soon. Um, sort of a slow return to maybe a little bit of normalcy. Still, for It's still only essential workers for the most part. Um, I believe retail stores are doing curbside pickup now so people can buy stuff. Uh, they could drive to a store and meet the owner outside. Um, right. Yeah, it's been an interesting okay. time. So you're the founder of Parametric Architecture. That's mostly like a digital media company and a software company? No, digital media company. We're just media company and we're not doing activities like design or software. Not like that. So tell me about when you started Parametric Architecture four years ago. Like what drove you to, to begin that venture? Yeah, it was really a good story. I think it's good story to tell and even good story to hear. Uh, it was back then four years ago, almost like 2015. Uh, let me just go back when uh, I chose my profession as a, to be to study at, as an architect okay, great. Uh, in the university. Yeah, let's go back then. So I, I had really deep uh, love for mathematics and during the high school and previous years. Uh, I, I had really deep love for mathematics, for physics, for chemistry, this kind of stuff. And I, I really wanted to study arc, uh, study physics and mathematics and nucle nuclear uh, energy, this kind of stuff at the university. Sure. But uh, uh, I'm Iranian. Do, I don't know you know or not. I'm Iranian and going to university in Iran is a little bit hard. You need to take an exam. and It's a, just a four hours of exam, including everything. And you need to just like uh, do a hundred questions in what, just four hours. So it's a really complicated uh, process of entering to the university so i i couldn't get the uh, scores to choose uh, mathematic or uh, fixed and they just offered me to choose architecture as a field of my study on the, in the university and i just didn't know anything about architecture so i i didn't have any background i didn't know what it really is but I chose it. Uh, I chose it, and I I went to the university. I started studying architecture at the first year, at the first days even. I didn't. Uh, I I I didn't. I had no clue what I am doing and what I'm learning. Uh, so my professors, my teachers, tried to uh, make me clear about the process of to become an architect. What is architecture? We learned sketches, this kind of stuff. 
So I graduated in 2012. And I, I had a military service in Iran for two, almost 19 months, 20 months, almost 20 months, yeah. And in 2015, I started living in Turkey, Istanbul. I moved to here and I started working as an architect. Uh, and I had a good experience of working as an architect in, in Iran, even uh, in projects and dealing with stuff. But when I started living in here, uh, it was just uh, 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 something new for me to combine. Because in Iran, the internet is not good and everything is just uh, is, 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 is forbidden. And you can't access YouTube. You can't access these kind of stuff. Sure. The free internet. You can't access these kind of free internets, free knowledge. So when I moved to Istanbul, I had really deep uh, research in parametric architecture, parametric design, computational design on YouTube. And YouTube gave me, gave me the opportunities to learn these kind of uh, software. And uh, in my architecture career, always I was searching about these new styles. Uh, and I before then, before 2015, I was seeing these designs, a special kind of organic designs called parametric designs. So I was always uh, wondering how do they design these kind of stuff, how they calculate, how they model. So one day I was sitting in the office uh, and I was searching for something on YouTube to remodel it on 3ds Max. I saw a girl, uh, and a Spanish girl, was just uh, doing a volume select uh, option on 3ds Max, and he was doing. She was doing something like a parametric surface uh, with with a special kind of pattern. So I didn't know what was she tell, what was she saying, but I I I I knew the 3ds Max, and I just applied whatever she she was doing, uh, in my design. It was a very cool pattern with closing and opening kind of uh, st uh, style. And I applied it and I just modeled it on my uh, screen as well. I said, oh, this is fascinating. Maybe I can just uh, apply this for a shelter, for a, something like pavil pavilion or installation. And I just did it. And I think this is a where architecture starts. And you see something, you see a very a basic idea, you take that idea and you turn it uh, uh, in, a, in, in an architecture scale, for example, a shelter or, or use it in facade or use it in the form of your design. I did it and it was really fascinating for me that uh, it kept me going and I tried to build some animations, tried to apply it on facades, tried to apply it on uh, another kind of pavilions. And during these processes, I, I was always reading about articles, what parametric and computational design is, how can I use them, how, what are the softwares, what are the benefits. I was reading books, I was researching about the projects, about the, uh, about the pioneers of industry. So one day I was sitting in the toilet in the office, actually. I said, uh, you know, maybe I can... I can open up a page on Instagram called Parametric Architecture, and I just can upload my own works on this on this page. Uh, I said, okay. I was sitting in the toilet. I signed out my own account, and I just signed up a new account, Parametric Architecture. Sure. Uh, it was Tukun, and I signed in Parametric dot Architecture. Uh, then I came back in the office in my on my computer. I made a very simple logo, PA. My previous logo, actually, uh, I made P bigger and a, a bit smaller. That was my logo, and I started uploading my own media, my own renders, my own uh, works on this channel. And uh, I, I did just get a couple of follows, like 30, 40 follows, and I had a video. Uh, it was a parametric facade. I uploaded, I posted it on uh, Instagram as well. In just one hour, it got uh, 2,000 2, views and big architects, like uh, big architecture pages just liked this video as well. And it just gave me a kind of a drive, energy, positive energy to keep this going. And 
I kept this, I kept it, and uh, I continued what I was doing back then, and uh, publishing my own works, basic ideas of computation and parametric design. And so when I reached to 10,000 followers on Instagram, I said, okay, maybe it's just enough to uh, be a selfish person and just to share other people, uh, other designers' works as well, and to share this knowledge, to share this information. So because back then when I was, when I was thinking about parametric and computational tools, I, I, was, I, I really couldn't breathe. I really couldn't sleep because I was just, I really wanted to put all my time, all my seconds, hours, minutes on this to learn new stuff. So because in that point, I think the reason I got really interested in parametric and computational style design tools is because I, I found a point with w which I connected mathematics with architecture. So with these tools, I can easily, uh, I was able to easily adapt with these formulas, with these numbers, with these calculations, parameters, and create my own design after these numbers and algorithms and relations. So after 10,000 followers, I started sharing projects, I started reading about them, writing about these projects, what are the parametric design principles, and like uh, to share knowledge, and the basic uh, things that this page, this, I don't want to call it page because we are not, we are more than a page now. Uh, the thing that I built the page on it is just to share information and uh, share knowledge about these tools and uh, design tools. Let's say just share knowledge about design tools. And it just got bigger by the time. The point that I stopped being selfish, it just got bigger. And I, I started from, from back then, after 10,000 followers, it just got really big. Uh, I reached like 50,000 followers, 60,000 followers. I started visiting architecture offices. I started uh, going and interviewing architects about these tools, asking about their ideas. How, do, uh, how are they managing with these tools? And then uh, it was like, yeah, a, a, February 2018, I started uh, PA Talks interviews. Uh, official uh, the, uh, official episode one of PA Talks was just uh, released on February 2018, and from that time, I think we released seven episodes, uh, and we're just on the go. And now we on Instagram, we have like 500,000, 536,000 followers on Instagram, on LinkedIn, 36,000 followers. Uh, during this pandemic time, we started interviewing architects on live on Instagram. Uh, we, I interviewed Peter Eisenman, I interviewed Patrick Schumacher, I interviewed uh, Maya Song, Fernando Romero, and uh, tomorrow I will interview Michael Rochkind and Hanif Kara next week. So this is a platform that I built to share the knowledge and information on it. And we're on the go. That's fascinating and really interesting to me in particular um, because I am trying to be in kind of the same position for 3D printed construction. So kind of similar to you, but not as long ago, maybe two years ago, I found myself really interested in automated construction. So I was like studying as much as I can about it, learning about all the companies that are in the industry. And I realized I had learned so much, but all the information I had was just in a Google Drive for myself. And I guess I, like you said, kind of stopped being selfish mm -hmm. and I shared some of the resources that I had online and it's not nearly as big as yours right now, but your Instagram analogy, I guess when you start seeing like big numbers like that, it starts to feel like a lot more significant um, and a lot more serious as opposed to somebody just like writing something or making something that nobody's going to find. Um, for exactly. me, it wasn't Instagram really. I posted some stuff on Instagram, but it didn't get like a lot of traction. I got maybe 1500 followers in like two or three months. Um, but TikTok was incredible. I chopped up some of the YouTube videos that I made about 3D printed construction into just shorter segments that were 15 seconds to a minute long. And within a month, like within the past month, now it's at close to 20,000 followers on TikTok. So that's kind of the platform oh. that I've started to get a little more momentum. 
Um, yeah, incredible. Uh, yeah, I, I think social media is just affecting architecture and affecting everything, I believe. And uh, affecting lives, professions are easy. I think they are affecting lives. They are changing the professions as well. They're creating new ways to, in every profession, like uh, media in architecture, maybe 30, 30 years ago, it was not that popular and it was not uh, as good as that time. Uh, but now it's a really good profession in architecture, in every art platform, I think. Media is a need, I think, for every platform. Yeah, especially when you have something uh, like a more specific topic, um, like parametric architecture, where you can talk to experts and you know enough about the topic to know which experts to talk to. And you can have seven conversations about the same thing and it's completely different every time. So it's like, it's a conversation that most people wouldn't have access to and you're kind of giving them access to these people that they might not know. Exactly, exactly. I remember when I first started visiting offices and doing small interviews on Instagram, I was doing live videos and I was trying to uh, connect the audience with architects and I was in the live show I was asking questions from the comments with from the architect so, so that was a kind of uh, a good strategy to connect uh, those top uh, high-end top architects with the audience and or top architects with their followers who are trying to ask something about their project so I got really great feedback, great comments, great thank you messages uh, from the things that I was doing. But I, I didn't get uh, really selfish with those comments or with those messages. I just kept going. And I think it's just, it gives us the opportunity to share whatever we have, to share whatever the information or the knowledge we are seeking for. And it, it's, it's, it's great. It's, I, I really love it. I really love doing these kind of stuff. So continue with your story. You were, uh, you were at work and you got ultimately 10,000 followers. And then did you start working on that full time or are you still working at that job? No, no. Uh, then I changed a couple of jobs until, uh, and so let me say it like this till 2019, February, February in 2019, uh, I was doing, I was working as an architect and computational design, designer. Uh, so the reason that I'm, uh, I, I can easily choose the projects uh, and uh, to publish them as a parametric architecture or parametric design, because I have worked on this field. I know how to compute a design. I know how to analyze or calculate a design. Uh, so I'm uh, because I have that background. I just opened up the, this platform. I created this platform. I'm not. I didn't create it as a random page to uh, then change the name to Parametric Architecture. And because I I was uh, I'm expert in this field. I opened this platform and I it had this kind of success and fi five hundred thousand followers. So uh, till 2019 February, I was working as an architect and computational design designer. Then I changed it completely to media. And till two till two months ago, I it was just a side hustle. But uh, according to pandemic and these kind of stuff, I I was able to change it to uh, full time job. And I saw the opportunity to invest my full time job, full full time to my own job, my own brand. Uh, it just really got a great attention on social media as well. I started this live session; they they were brilliant, and I got uh, I, I interviewed with many many famous architects and designers. Wow! So you're two months so, into making your your side venture, your full time venture. That's so exciting. Yeah, full full time. Yeah, after four years, this is the two months that. So this is the second month that I'm working as a full time on my own brand. And so how much have you seen a difference in your ability to advance the brand in the past two months? Fully, fully. Like uh, it, it, it just doubled up 200%. Like 
for as an example, I'm saying as an example, in one month, uh, I get like 16,000 followers uh, on Instagram in one month during the pandemic and the media that I shared, the activities that I did on social media, I got it doubled, like 32,000 followers uh, wow. in just a month. So that, that is the thing that because I'm working full time and even not full time, not 10 hours, not 12 hours, 19 hours, I, I sleep at 3 a.m. And then I get up at uh, 8, 8 a.m. So like five, six hours I sleep because I saw the opportunity here. And I, I because everyone is now on Internet during this pandemic. Uh, everyone is just using internet, trying to inspire from something or follow something and trying to watch something. And I got that opportunity. I got, I used that opportunity because I was ready to do it. So it was really great for me to use this uh, pandemic period. Then we started publishing our conference. We made an online conference, which is on 13th and 14th of June. So maybe we till now we, we get like 300 registrants and uh, maybe we can reach to 500 as well. So it's kind of great thing to see positive side of everything and use your own time to invest on these positive uh, stuff. Yeah, certainly. That's a really cool story. Um, I don't know. Yeah, thank you how many people have side hustles that they can re like relate to that, but to be able to take something that you've been working on for so long, and I'm sure for a long time, um, it probably wasn't generating revenue, especially in the beginning, you're just like sharing things on an Instagram account. Uh, but exactly. once you have a half a million followers at that point, then you start to get the attention from brands that want to capture your audience. Um, and you have a big platform that you can offer them. So I guess that's exactly that's the way you were able to make a transition into a full-time role. Exactly. Exactly. The, because till during the that four years, I, I had no income. Like I was just investing from my own pocket to uh, fool this platform to, to its, to its best position. But now I can easily get uh, like, I have income from this platform of, from the conference that I'm making and uh, I, I'm reaching to new investors. These kind of stuff are just happening. Uh, but the thing is, I had never, I had never uh, had the like uh, the audacity to cross that red line. Uh, yeah, I was scared. Maybe I cannot make that much money, and I need to get back to another job. But during this pandemic, I made it like. I crossed that red line of the fear and I said, I need to make it. I need to make this. And if I can't make this at my thirties, I cannot even make it on my forties or fifties. I need to try it. I need to try it. I, uh, previously I, I tried many things and I just failed, but now I need to, to, I really needed to go on my own direction. So I left my job. Actually, I didn't left. They fired me. They 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 wanted uh, from me fifty percent of my company, but I, but I refused. Uh, then they they fired me. They wanted fifty so percent of your company. Yeah, yeah. My, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, so I was working for that company for two years, and they saw the growth on my page. They saw the growth on the platform, but they then. They offered 50 for the company. Would you like to sign this contract? And the money, there was no money deals. So they said, if you want to continue in here, just sign the deal 50%. We want your company and you will do the activities in here. And I said, no, that's not fair. I just, I just quit that job. They fired me. I, did, I didn't quit. They fired me and I started investing my own time on this platform. Thanks God. It just got better and I'm really super satisfied of the things uh, that, that, that my decisions like I'm super satisfied of my decisions now yeah I'm sure with all that growth now you're getting access to more architects um, and you'll be able exactly. to create all kinds of more content so what kind of content do you plan on focusing on in the future yeah basically we on this platform we are focused on 
uh, not just architecture. Uh, we're focused on these tools on every aspect of design, like compute computational and parametric design is in in the industrial design, in product design, in jewelry design, in interior design, in architecture, uh, I don't know, maybe other platforms, structural, structural engineering. Uh, we're just focused on these, these, uh, these professions. And we're just sharing from fashion, we're, we're publishing from jewelry design, from product design. And what we are focused right now to publish these information vastly uh, and try to make the people understand that computational design could be a new profession, uh, a new kind of discipline uh, connecting with other disciplines. Uh, so these, to do this, actually, we try to establish this conference in next, uh, next month. So we will talk about a lot of stuff with, in this conference about computational and tutorials, live mentorship, uh, how, how, art, how media is affecting architecture, how these side disciplines like computational design is affecting other disciplines as well. Yeah, so that'll be incredibly valuable. Like you said, you went on YouTube to learn about some of the parametric design things. Now it's been so many years, there's so many advancements it would be fantastic yes. if you could use your platform um, to kind of fuel online education even. Is that part yes. of your plan? Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. We're just using this platform to uh, fuel the online education because uh, I learned everything from YouTube, actually. I learned how to work with Adobe Premiere. I learned how to work with After Effects, 3Ds Max, uh, Rhino, Grasshopper, Revit, AutoCAD, everything that I'm expert now, I learned from YouTube. So till, the, till, some le till some level, YouTube is really great. But after that, to become very advanced, to become a, in a very advanced level, go with some mentors as well. And maybe in the future, we will do we'll just work workshops alone, like four hours for workshops in one day. So it would be really useful for audience to, to follow these kind of stuff or learn from these kind of uh, workshops. Yeah, that's awesome. So when you were um, starting off, you mentioned like you put some of your own money into it, um, invested in your own brand. What were some of the better investments that you made in helping grow the brand and the power of the audience? uh like for my own brand i just uh my time was the biggest investment uh, on this brand but gaining credibility like uh connecting with other architects and collaborations the collaborations that i did for competitions for workshops for interviews for I don't know, for example, bringing Peter Eisenman to this live session, to this brand, it just really got a lot of credibility and authenticity to my brand, actually. But if you search on Instagram about all those architecture pages, which I call pages, they are just pages. None of the, these kind of pages are doing these activities. They're just publishing pictures, images, and maybe small information. But I never stopped just publishing on in, in pictures. I, I continue to do like interviews, like posting about computational jobs, like wh wherever there was a job vacancy about a computational designer, I posted them on platforms. Where I wrote articles. I wrote like I I managed competitions, workshops, lectures. I brought uh, famous architects in Istanbul to speak about their works. So I'm not just a page and I did a lot of things for this platform. Maybe at first I didn't really gain money. I invested my own money and my own time. So when, I, when, when you have nothing, when you're young and you have nothing, your time is the most valuable asset that you have and you can invest your time on everything. So till now I invested my time and my own money 
So after four or five years, it's just getting back to me little by little. Uh, but I'm very, really satisfied of that. Yeah, I can totally appreciate that, especially since like I'm trying to do something similar. I haven't found jobs for people. That's actually a terrific idea uh, in exactly. concrete printing. If I know people that are looking to hire, um, maybe having like a listing on my website with jobs listings, that's it's fantastic. I mean, it's really cool for me to see like after four years of your progress, how far you've come because I'm hoping to put in like four years and hopefully get to a similar level of progress maybe. But I know that like the most important part is providing value to the, to the area and the space. So kind of like you're exactly. saying, you're hitting the, the audience of people who want to talk to the architects, you're providing the architects with an audience and then you're helping engineers connect with various companies that they might want to work for and designers. Um, I guess most exactly. Uh, what type of engineer do you work with mostly? Architects? Uh, yes, those kind of engineers, because uh, till now, all my works was just about architecture. The, the things that I have done before, yes, they were all about uh, architects, architecture, architecture engineering, like structural engineering or uh, I, I'm really into 3D printing and robotic construction as well. Cool. And beside that, artificial intelligence in architecture, I'm really interested. And we publish articles, we publish projects, and I support workshops which are trying to uh, teach uh, robotic construction as well. I, I support vastly on the, on the platform. Like I publish their workshops. I I try to reach the maximum audience to uh, for these uh, platforms. So these are the things that I'm really interested in. And uh, sorry, what was your question? I really forget it. Um, I don't know. It just continue with where you're going with it. Yeah, yeah. These are the things that I'm really interested in, and uh, I, I'm really fascinated to see uh, how to build a building. Not this much complex building, uh, not a skyscraper or not a shopping mall. Like a small five, five rooms building, maybe on Mars or small kind of shelters uh, with these robotic constructions on really dangerous areas. And I, I believe these robotic constructions will just help us a lot to... Uh, to maximize and to push forward the human ability to live on dangerous environments like Mars, maybe like Moon. So I'm I'm following these topics as well. I'm uh, trying to connect with these industries as well, trying to make some workshops, collaborations, interviews. So these are my uh, interested topics as well. Yeah, the whole COVID situation gives opportunity to do these workshops kind of from a distance. So I guess it sounds like in the past you've set up workshops where people have actually come together in person um, and had a panel. Exactly. Speech. But that's a big setup. You need to rent a space. You need to like make sure everybody's there at the same time, traveling, whatever. Um, now you have big news networks, like the biggest news networks doing just Zoom calls on TV. So it's totally acceptable for you to have a panel of maybe five speakers on a Zoom call, and you can fit way more people in an audience on the internet than you can in any room. So I think it's, uh, it's a really powerful time to be in your position where you can set up a panel of speakers and maybe when before having it be over Zoom might have looked unprofessional, now it's like the new normal. Exactly, exactly. Before, yeah, I. I was dreaming to talk Peter Eisenman. Really, it was super hard because the interview formats that I made uh, was just one on one and me sitting on, on this side of the desk and the other the architect sitting on the other side of the desk, uh, just interviewing on this format. It was weird to call someone to come and live interview or to record and get send me the videos. This was really weird stuff, but. I saw the opportunity here to connect with uh, 
top architects to connect with the pioneers of the industry. And it's now the new normal. Like everybody says, oh, okay, I can join. Uh, on, on Wednesday, we will interview with James uh, James von Clemented. I think I, I, if I uh, spell the right, spell, uh, pronounce the right, is the president of uh, Competers and Fox from New York. They will join us, and it's a great opportunity to interview with such a uh, uh, successful architect and such a pioneer in the industry. So we need to see the positive side of everything and use uh, use it for our brands as well. If from from any of my interviews, any student or one student just got inspired and tried to bring something new, try to. Uh, invent or discover or design something new or design something that is really a need for our industry now that's the part of i think i did my own part that's yeah. the thing that i want just one person that's enough for me personally i think i would like to buy a printer for construction um I would like to get one of those 3D printers and start doing projects and hopefully printing houses if they could be residentially permitted. Um, preferably in America because that's where I live and I like it here, but I would totally be willing to go somewhere else if they made it like legal first. Um, so it's just, uh, I guess, a matter of time for me gathering more knowledge and more research resources um, so that when the time comes, I can attack that problem. Yeah, exactly. You don't need actually uh, uh, the that I the, the time to be legalized. This kind of stuff, you can do a lot of things. Uh, you shouldn't just wait for them, and you can maybe have a three D printer. Maybe you can have a robotic arm. Uh, you can start experimenting on your own when the time comes you are ready and uh, you can easily uh, pick as the pioneer of your 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 uh, industry to 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 do these works like uh, you shouldn't wait for i think for 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 be legalizing or anything because when it 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 becomes legalized everybody will jump on it that's but true. When you're ready, it's legalizing. When you're ready, it's legalizing. You can do e do it easily. So I think uh, you shouldn't wait. I'm hoping that if I grow a big enough audience, maybe a company will want to do a partnership where maybe they lend me a printer and I do a video with it, uh, or something like that, where it can be publicity for them. Um, or I don't know. Yeah. I haven't figured out the specifics yet. Yeah, I'm sure you will figure it out. And don't just stop. Whatever you do, just don't stop. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm do actually, it. I'm planning on going to Austin um, on the 25th of May. So pretty soon uh, they have a 3D printed house project down there with Icon Build. Have you heard of it? Yes, I've contacted them a couple of times for, uh, we have been in contact, yeah, a couple of times, Icon Build, I remember. Yeah, so I'm hoping but it to, was uh, last year, I think. It was last year we, we were in contact. I'm hoping to see some of the stuff they're doing. I don't know how active or like on site they are right now with everything going on. Uh, but we'll see. I'll be there for a month, so I'll probably uh I'm sure something interesting will happen. Yeah. It will be good for for you, I think. Yeah, after that I want to like keep traveling around to other kind of newer sites, uh, newer construction sites. First, I guess while all the like travel restrictions are going on, I'll just drive around America because that's easier for me. Um, and then when the world opens up, I'm hoping I can go to uh, like the Middle East and Dubai in August. But we'll see if that timeline works out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these places are really awesome to visit or maybe to work as well have you been into dubai there's a lot of opportunities in middle east no no i haven't but i've collaborated with someone in dubai uh 
it was awesome. Yeah, they're working on some incredible projects down there. And they're very forward thinking exactly. with their construction. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Dubai is just really great place. I would love to visit soon. Yeah, how old were you when you moved away from Iran? I guess if you had served in the military for a few years, you were like 20 something? Uh, I finished my bachelor's in 2012. I was 23 years old. Then in 2015, uh, I moved to Turkey. I was 25 years old. I was 25, 26 years old. And now I'm 30. When you look back at the time that you served in the army, uh, do you look back on it like with happy memories? Actually, it's you have to do the military service in Iran. You don't have an, another option because yeah. they don't they won't give you any passport. So, as I said, I I had no choice. It was obligation, and I had no choice. I needed to do it. It's better to not to do it if you have any choice. If you can make a choice, yes or no, I would choose. But nobody no. has a choice. Nobody has the choice. You need to do it. it kept me like uh, more stronger than before. It made, it made me to be more stronger than before. Certainly. And uh, uh, like I was just in military. Yeah, I, I jumped in fully to, into architecture. And it was really good for me to 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 experience this military service. Yeah, I have a lot of international friends, and all of them from countries that have a mandatory military service. Um, they usually look back at it as like a time of camaraderie, uh, where they made some friends, and they like like you said, became stronger through some discipline and stuff like that. Uh, it's an it's a unique system where the country kind of doesn't really give you much of a choice of whether to join, but it's always it's fascinating because I guess it uh, it builds character and it also builds some unity in the country when everybody's been through the same experience. Exactly, it builds your character. It it, it teaches you discipline. It it gives you the uh, it teaches you how to be. <laughs> Uh, an organized person, <laughs> like getting up early in the morning or go to bed, or working hard. So I think uh, it has military service had really a good impact on me during my life, and not to be very soft. I don't like to be soft, and I'm really a hard worker. Whatever happens to my life. I see it positive and I go for it to do, to solve it. I'm like a firefighter. Like I, I, I try to keep this. I try to fix this. I try to, uh, to do everything on my own. And yeah. I can relate to that, that completely. Now, yeah. The, the way that you're smiling that you about now, it. I did a lot of things. I can tell that when, yeah. like, even when the emergencies come up and there's something that you have to deal with, uh, put out the fire. It seems like you like putting out the fire. Yes, yes, exactly. Like the emergency That's makes it important. Exactly, exactly. I love that same feeling. It's like when you know something you're doing is going to be important or it has to get done, or if you don't do it, something bad could happen. Just like getting it done in that situation uh, when it needs to, and you really may not have any other choice. Those are like the most pure moments. Um, I guess it's kind of like an entrepreneurial trait to to like those situations because some people when they find themselves under pressure like that they crumble and so they would rather have be in a safe environment where the decisions they make aren't going to have such a big impact exactly that's 100 percent true i totally agree with you because uh i'm not me i if i'm not uh, entering to any challenges or dealing with these problems i I'm not me. I see myself when I'm dealing or challenging with something. And with these challenges, you become, you, you become a new you. Like you discover yourself more. And the more you are challenging with these stuff, the more you know about yourself. So uh, whenever I try to solve something, like 
I see, oh, I was capable of doing it as well. So this is good for me. I, I know my new capabilities, my new abilities, my new, like, uh, my new skills. So it's really fascinating. And I believe who is not challenging himself or not trying to solve anything, they don't know about themselves. They, they are just 20% of themselves. Like, but if they try to go to a challenge, to go to solve anything, to solve problems to not to get back or not to get down when they see a problem uh, they go and discover themselves they solve the problems and they learn new skills i saw the, every challenge a new opportunity actually so that's my point of view not everybody believes in believes in this in this view but I believe every challenge is a new opportunity to discover yourself and to learn something new. Yeah, sure. So with all of the content that you produced, um, sharing it on all your different platforms uh, can become kind of like an arduous task a little bit when there's so many different platforms you're operating on and you're trying to share content in so many different forms. Is there a way you've kind of like learned to handle the the boring stuff better? Uh, definitely, that's the hard work part, um, and that's the time-consuming part as well. Yeah. So I need I, I have a couple of uh, friends who are now helping me. We we call uh, the team PA Next. Uh, so the team PA next is the innovative team at the background of uh, at the back of uh, parametric architecture and PA. So these these friends are helping me like writing articles or, or its own language. You can't publish the YouTube videos on, for example, on Instagram. You can't publish Instagram stories as posts on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Every all of these platforms have their own languages and you need to talk with their own language and you need to post on their own formats. So this is really time consuming for us. Uh, but we have three friends who are managing Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, me and another friend uh, managing uh, Instagram. Uh, in interviews, we have two friends, me and another friend actually managing. I, I would like to say their all names actually in here Aslu, Aslihan, Aisu, Baren, Doruk, Zuhra and a couple of other friends who are trying to join and Yamur as well. Uh, they, we're actually uh, almost like seven people including uh, plus me eight people so just trying to push forward this brand. How soon did you take on your first team member? Like it was, uh, uh, my first team member was my girlfriend. <laughs> so it's three, it was three years ago. Back then I had like 90,000 followers. So she helped me a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. My first team member, uh, and she, her name is Asli, actually. Asli means original. <laughs> so my second team member was, uh, six months ago and then sorry sorry eight, mo eight months ago Doruk was the second then third was Yamor fourth was Aishu and uh, it just kept kept on going that's really cool I would love to try to build a team someday but I'm like I'm not quite there yet I need to there's more work for me to do by myself before I'm ready to have work for other people yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, uh, when you are overworked, like uh, you're full, you have a lot of things to do, but and you are gaining a couple of, uh, you're gaining like money as well. You need to separate those works. But if you're not earning, you need to uh, do all those works on your own. And uh, so that's that's the thing that's building the team. Just helps a lot. Um, you mentioned um, 
that you've been interested in uh, 3D concrete printing lately, and it's like parametrics applications there. Um, let's talk about that. Yeah, uh, what do you want to me to tell? So what do you, um, what do you think are the most interesting applications uh, and, the, and the best ways to combine the two? Like how do they, how do they mesh together the most powerfully? Uh, actually, I, personally, I haven't worked on any, any kind of 3D printing, 3D concrete printing, but uh, I think uh, they have a special kind of softwares to combine uh, Grasshopper, uh, Rhino with that, uh, uh, with, with that KUKA robots. Yeah. Uh, and whatever the things that you do on on Grasshopper and 3D environment in Rhino, it's been calculated. And then you just send them to the soft, special, special softwares that robot is connected. So they, are try, they, they, they recognize all, that, all those data and you give the materials, you, need, you give the, uh, all the things that 3D printing needs. So it starts just printing. I'm, I was not personally involved in the, uh, like physically, personally involved in the process of printing, 3D printing concrete. But I think, I hope uh, in the near future, I will be involved as well because uh, everything that I was doing about reading, like these kind of stuff, not personally involved. Yeah, if I get my hands on a printer, I'll let you know. And if you want to send me an STL, maybe I can print it for you. <laughs> yes, for sure. Maybe we can do a workshop together. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Maybe, uh, maybe within a year or two. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm interested. We'll see how. Just send me it. a send me a message on LinkedIn, and I'm on it. Yeah, for sure. So you are interested in 3D printing. Do you have a 3D printer? No, we had in the office. I, that's why I never. Uh, I was never interested in buying one and whatever I was doing. So I was printing over there, but uh, I was never dreamed of having a 3D print printing uh, in my own. Like uh, I, I, I was never interested to having one. I was, I don't know, but the technology is magnificent. And because we, we used to print in 2D, then the idea of changing the 3D print, 2D print to 3D is just always magnificent for me. So, and I would like to mention this as well. All, those te all these technologies, design tools that we have in our hand today, they were not built for architects. And architects were always in search, in discover, uh, in explore to bring other technologies from other disciplines to architecture. For example, Rhino was never built for architecture. AutoCAD was never built for architecture. Katia was never built for architects. And uh, Rhino was for industrial design, automation, automation, uh, aut uh, car companies. Katia was just for airplane companies. Uh, AutoCAD was built for engineers. 3D printings, first 3D printings were just built by dentists. So architects are always in the search of uh, bringing new technologies into our profession. And now uh, this gap between architecture and construction is getting closed, is just making very small because before architects were meant to just make draw drawings or notations or do drawings of the buildings or anything. And they they make those notations and give the builder and then the constructor or the builder would build the buildings for them. But now because architects are just entering to this world of computational like uh, 3D printing, concrete printing, so they're closing that gap and we see high quality designs, high quality structures and with these computational tools as well, the, the gap between engineers and architects as are closing as well so they are easily working together and in those uh, associative environment of designing a structure and architecture together as well so i think the future would be more greater than this 
the, the time that we are living in as well, because I have always a, a glimpse to the future and I'm really interested what's going to happen in the future, how AI will help uh, architects as well. So I would like to mention that uh, architects, not, not, none of these softwares was built for architects, but architects just exploring and bringing these tools to architecture profession. What would you say to somebody who is studying to be an architect or in architecture school right now and is not learning parametric design? Actually, I, I would like to mention that every design that we are making, it is parametric. Every architecture that we are doing is parametric because parametric, the word parametric comes from mathematics. I don't want to go to the history of where did it come from and who are just worked on this term or on this, uh, on this method of style, style of or method of design because it's really time consuming. But I would like to mention a couple of names uh, guys like Antonio Gaudi, architects like Antonio Gaudi and Luigi Moretti or Frey Otto or uh, I don't know, Frank Gehry, Peter Eisenman or uh, Samuel Gaysberg. These guys, uh, designers, architects and engineers really helped on the, uh, on the uh, uh, developing of these kind of softwares to be used in architecture and engineering. So the word parametric comes from the mathematics and it means variable. So every variable that you are using in your design, it, it makes your design parametric. So in, in any design, we are using thousands of these kind of variables. But why we started using this term like in 30 years, 40 years ago, and it, it, it was used before, but not this, this vastly. And because 40 years ago, computers came to life and they let us, they enabled us these opportunities to define parameters to computers. So during this design process, we were able to define parameters and define algorithms, relations, like associating with a couple of parameters and creating final result. And during the design process, you, would able, you were able to change these parameters and see the final results simultaneously on your screen. So this is the thing that enabled us to use the term parametric in architecture. And the parametric architecture is relied on parametric design. And parametric design is a couple, uh, is, 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 is a method, is a, a, a pr approach in architecture and also in design world as well. So my advice would be uh, don't try to uh, get away with these tools because these tools will help us to uh, design and will, will help us to uh, find new ways new uh, find new ways to uh, design our environments better they will help us to find optimized designs they will help us to be more faster so if you don't uh, have any access or any information about these tools, it doesn't matter. Just go and learn them. Uh, back then when AutoCAD came and those architects who didn't adapt themselves with AutoCAD, they just ran out of the game. And these are just the tools. You need to learn it. It's just a pen. You write with a pen or draw with a pen. I, I write a, an envelope or I write a letter with a pen. Somebody somebody else writes a poem. This is the difference. I'm using this pen and somebody else is using this that pen as well. So see it as tool and try to um, convey your ideas with these tools. These are just helps for us. Today we have this, this tool in our hands. 10 years after this, we will have another tool. So you need to adapt yourself with these tools and show your designs with these tools as well. So don't get stuck into the software. Don't get uh, stuck uh, like uh, into the parametric softwares. Uh, just stick into your profession and uh, what you are meant to do as an architect, but learn these softwares as well. So that would be my advice to uh, learn these softwares to students.
Yeah, that sounds like good advice. Uh, kind of just for them to stay educated. And like you said, architects are always looking for new technologies to bring to the table. And they need to be those architects that are keeping an eye on the different technological advancements because the ones who aren't keeping their eyes open end up left behind when technology becomes old technology becomes obsolete, becomes replaced by more efficient technology. So exactly. You mentioned before AI. And I guess you also mentioned like optimization and making things faster. It, are those the primary benefits of AI? Like where does how does AI fit in with parametric design? I think AI is the very, 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 very advanced level of computational and parametric design. And it will help us to find more uh, great solutions and define more great parameters in our design and will help us to, like, to be more faster. And I don't need to uh, like sit and design a detail for thousands of time for every project. So I, I have designed it and I will just use uh, those details and I, I will teach the computer. I'm not really uh, professional in the topic of machine learning or, or how AI works and I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I, I know that if, if there's any technology coming, we need to learn uh, how to drive that technology, how to deal with that technology, not just in just uh, stand in front of it to uh, not to develop it. So the things that are being worked as uh, the future of architecture these days, so like creating uh, plans, pr creating residential plans, or uh, just uh, you teach the computer uh, with, a, with thousands of plans, and after thousands of plans, it just draws you a normal uh, plan of uh, a residential project for you. You teach uh, like uh, how to, um, I had some studies about like uh, giving proposals for clients uh, with my friend Mustafa in here in Istanbul. So uh, you teach uh, out of the a hundred of the proposals that you give the client and they, they were declined, you teach the computer and he he chooses for you the best option to uh, to 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 uh, present to your client. Maybe that would be accepted. So these are the things that can be done in the future, but it's not easy to be to do it. So large biggest companies in the world like Autodesk or Rhino or uh, Adobe, maybe they are trying to bring these software, these tools in architecture as well, but. We will see what happens. Yeah, the first um, like design software that I learned was SketchUp back when Google owned Google SketchUp. Uh, when I was like a little kid, 13, um, I forget how I got exposed to it first. I think it was some like computer class in school or something. Uh, mm -hmm. But I really was interested in the program and it was free. So I downloaded it on like my home computer. And I just messed around with it. When I was younger, I thought I wanted to become an architect for a long time. But uh, I guess ultimately, when I went to university, I picked the major uh, business and engineering. So it was kind of just like a generalist um, background on like physics, chemistry, like math, uh, and then also classic business courses, um, some business statistics. Um, and like marketing, finance, accounting, like just intro into so many different topics. So, um, yeah, I never nice. chased the, the architecture dream, but parametric design is really exciting to me because it seems like once you make a design, the software could tell you if it's structurally secure or not. So the time is like, I don't, I always picture a time where somebody who is not an architect could use a software so simple that they could make a house that an architect could then just like run an analysis on with the software and make sure that it's uh, structurally secure. Do you think that's a reality, potential reality? Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And uh, 
maybe the number of the architects will be reduced by the, by the time till that time when that software comes uh, i'm not sure uh, when we will have it in our, in our hands uh, to have that kind of software but it will happen one day and architects are not going to anymore deal with these uh, small stuff they will de they will deal with the complexity they will deal with the analy analysis of like uh, how to create more comfortable how to create more like uh, deep spaces uh, for people or for residential project how to c c make for more more comfort comfortable spaces so i think uh, that will be a reality maybe soon enough yeah i can kind of picture it um maybe like one person creates a parametric design for like a certain style of house. Maybe the house has like certain variables, like how many bedrooms, bathrooms, whatever. Um, and a certain like, maybe they all have the same size windows or the same size doors, or they just have something that makes them all look like a family of houses. And with a parametric AI software, he could generate 200 different house models that all share similar characteristics in different layouts and formats. And people could go, say, on a website and tour around all the like 200 different models of houses, even though the person only made a parametric design for one. And with the 3D concrete printing technology, they could pick a house that's been designed that maybe even no one ever seen before and have it printed, potentially start the print that same day. Exactly. Exactly. That's totally possible. We have now platforms on the internet that give you the possibility of like choosing your design uh, online. And they have a couple of parameters, like 10 parameters to like, it's a bracelet. For example, it's a bracelet or it's a ring or, or it's an earring. So it's an online platform. You go there, you choose your parameters, bigger, smaller. You choose the color. The more dense, less dense. And oh, Shape just, Driver. Yes, Shape Driver. I collaborated with them. Uh, uh, there are a couple of others as well. Uh, then they print it, they, they send it to you. Imagine this in an architectural scale, like in a house, like in a, maybe a skyscraper would be like very hard, but house is e the easiest one, like in two bedroom house, three bedroom house, with the 3D printing technology, maybe after five or 10 years, we can see this. I don't know. That's possible, totally possible. And with just one parameter, you change another uh, to another alternative. That's possible, I think. But we will see it in the future, maybe 10 years. The interesting part is the technology seems like it's so close to being there. Like, like it's almost possible to do now, but there's so many... Uh, I mean, there's no huge motivation to do that unless you find that it's dramatically cheaper, obviously. And it's still going to be scary for people, for investors to invest in a construction project, the likes of which no one has ever seen before. People investing that much money, they always want to see like past examples um, and they want references. But when it's a brand new technology, there's nothing really to reference. So it's just, uh, I guess, a trust the process kind of situation. Um, yeah, it's going to take a lot more people think, knowing about yeah, the technology. It, yeah, it will happen someday, but not, uh, not today maybe, because when the computers came, it was really expensive enough that not, not anybody could buy it. Like, but after 30 years, 20 years, you have that small laptop on your knees. Like it's really cheap actually from in comparison to that time and after the technology and the investments like the time goes on people would easily accept it and still and try to use it and start to use these technologies as well so um as opposed to like ways parametric design could be used in the future what's the most interesting way to you that you've seen parametric design being used in the past and present in the past and the present, 
uh, actually in the in the last 20 or 30 years uh, what parametric design meant to be was just a cosmetic uh, part of the design like uh, you would create uh, great curvatures like a great complexity or the visual complexity or 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 uh, or beautiful uh, buildings, beautiful shapes, forms, these kind of stuff. But uh, in the past ten or five years, uh, it's it just changed a little bit, and this computational and parametric design tool just get get into background like. Uh, you don't see it anymore on the forefront of the design. Uh, for example, I, I would like to mention the uh, cyber truck, you know, by Elon Musk. Yeah, sure. It's I love just, that. It just really looks c simple, like very simple design with those uh, hard lines of like triangular or rectangular lines. It, lo it looks really simple, but in comparison to like a Mercedes, Mercedes Benz or BMW or Ferrari, you can't compare these two cars. This car just looks really simple, but I really see in the backside of this car the complexity, the engineering that they made this car. Like it's so powerful. It's so uh, like uh, it's so great actually. But in those cars, you can't see it. You just see the visual beauty. But this car doesn't have much visual beauty. It's simple. But the actual beauty is at the, at the backside of it, the engineering power. So I think uh, what was interesting about these tools 10, 20 years ago, it was just the visual part, how to create these uh, appealing, how to create these uh, beautiful stuff. But now I think it's just totally changing uh, to create more optimized, more simple stuff. Because technology is always here to make our lives simple, not just complex. Uh, but some people, some architects, some designers are using the notion of parametric and computational design because we can do it. It's not good to design those curvatures or those complexity just because we can do it. You, you need to use these tools to uh, make it simple to understand or make it simple to, uh, to help uh, to understand. Yeah, so I think I the think big difference, what you're getting at is like the value added being aesthetics and the looks of it versus yes. a functionality like using exactly. less material or making the print time faster or making it stronger. Um, I think that's really exactly. like kind of what you're getting at, like aesthetics versus practicality. And I exactly. agree a hundred percent. Like once you move from just people wanting these projects because they think it looks cool, totally like subjective, you can make it objective by benefiting important things like structure and efficiency and material use. A hundred percent right. A hundred percent right. And I'm really looking forward to it in the future as well. How this parametric or computational tools will uh, go back and will sh show the objectivity of the design, like how we will uh, try to use to create more optimized, more strong, more uh, like these kind of stuff. Yeah, I think people would be interested to see the process um, as someone's designing something creative. I'm sure it is a process and it's an evolving process, but somebody who's experienced with it probably has a lot more power over like the designs that they can get the parametric tool to show them. Like mm -hmm. it's almost as if if you're setting all these parameters and you want options in the end like you don't necessarily know what all those options are. Like you're trying to find the best solution. You don't have the best solution. So to, I guess, just to see that process from an expert, I guess would be really fascinating probably for people. I don't know, maybe in a, on a platform like YouTube or something like that. Exactly. That's, 
Yeah, even in TikTok. <laughs> have you signed up? Have, do you have a TikTok account? Yeah, uh, TikTok just consumes a lot of my time actually to post. Yeah. I have an account, but I have I couldn't continue because it consumes it. It, ha it needs too much time. Like yeah, I put like two hours or uh, one hour for every post on Instagram to including other platforms, but TikTok needs more time. So yeah. till now, and I, I don't know, is, is it a good platform? Till now, I'm just watching. I don't know, it's, is it a good platform for architecture or not? Yeah, I don't think but, there's a lot of um, like seasoned professionals there. You're not going to find, it's not going to get you access to um, like more experienced architects, but it will yes. get you access to an audience that's kind of interested in design. Um, I don't know, I'm not an expert on that platform by any means. And I don't even, uh, I don't use it much, but I have a younger brother who's 13 years old and he is, I saw him on the platform. And that's what made me think of like adding it because it's, I guess, reaching a, I thought it was reaching the younger audience, but when I was <laughs> posting construction and those kind of related videos, it actually turns out most of the accounts following me were people who had profile pictures that looks like they could be 30 or 40 years old. So there's a oh. range of, um, there's a range of audiences on the platform. And most of the, the dominating stuff is like dance videos and like silly things. So when 100%. I post like serious engineering kind of stuff, um, yeah, it doesn't get as much publicity, but the algorithm that they have is pretty good. So they, I guess, know the right people to show it to. And right now it's at a stage where it's dominated by all these people making like silly dance videos and stuff. So I think when you post more serious engineering things, there's people who want that. And there's people who like, there's people who don't want to see the stupid dance videos and they're more interested in engineering technology stuff, just like on Instagram. Um, yeah, of course, like the exactly. singers and famous people get the most views, but there's still an audience for people who are interested in like parametric architecture and design and all kinds of different fields of engineering. So I, I definitely think that you should, uh, you should keep posting stuff, maybe even the same stuff from Instagram to TikTok for now. Um, even yes, if, it, uh, if that's the only way that you're posting, I think that's better than not posting anything. And if the audience gets bigger, then at that point you could like reassess how much effort you're putting into the platform. Exactly. A hundred percent true. Uh, we'll see. I'm just till now watching. We'll see what happens. I, I will start TikTok as well. Yeah. Maybe you can get a new, uh, a new intern or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly how did you uh, find the people that you're working with they were just friends of yours that wanted to get involved or uh, they just messaged me that's they just messaged me and they're all architects and i i didn't ask ask for their portfolio or their cv i just if you like writing if you like media of course come and join and i i just tested a couple of times if they can write or they can be interested in public publications or interviews, this stuff, then I got them easy. I'm not, I'm really easy at, at hiring. Uh, till now I haven't fired any, <laughs> but uh, I'm easy going guy. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you give them a platform and then they, provide content that's valuable to your viewers so it's a really good symbiotic relationship yes yes and they 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 get the publicity with their own names as well but on the, uh, with the team pa next actually uh, like every activity that they do uh, it's with their own name not just with the name of like uh, hamit or hamit hasanzade for example every interview that they do every publications that they do it's just with their own name so it's almost like you have like pa and then pa next is almost like an employee owned organization it's not employee it's the name of the team that we're managing it pa next is not another type of uh, organization or it's another. the same entity it's the same yeah exactly it's the same we just post daily stuff on PA Next, like how we work, how about the daily stuff. Uh, that's it. 
Is anyone else on the team full time? No, except me. Well, it's only been two months, so it's gonna hopefully uh, maybe with it will take time. Year. Yeah, they're not even uh, part time. Like they they do whenever uh, they have time, like yeah. twice a week, three times a week, or once a month. That's that's how uh, I try to work with my team. That's good for like a media company. Um, I was in the newspaper club at my university and it was very similar. I mean, you just get some people write once or twice a year. Other people write like very often and people just kind of contribute when they want to. It's a healthy environment because it's like nobody's forced to make any deadlines or anything like that. Exactly. So it's just like, I think it shows through um, the passion for what people are doing shows through in the writing because the audience can get a feel for um, that they're kind of just doing it out of their own intent. Exactly, 100%. And I don't push them to like, uh, you have to do this or uh, we have a deadline. They, they do whatever, whenever they like and whatever they do. And uh, they say if I want to publish once a year or once a month or once a week, it's just okay for me. And they do their own work. And on their free time or whenever they want to work, they just uh, work for PA. Have you ever hosted a competition uh, for parametric design, like comparing designs? No, not officially for parametric design. But uh, I, I did collaborate with uh, Nike and Laceless Design. I collaborated with Laceless Design uh, to find an intern about uh, a parametric designer for Nike. It, to find an intern for Nike, Nike. Other than that, I collaborated with a pandemic uh, architecture competition with, by Archisearch. But other than that, no more competitions. Just two. That's really cool that you mentioned Nike because I hadn't even thought about parametric design with shoes. But now that you mention it, I'm thinking of all these, like the new soles that I've seen in different shoes that are like um, almost like spongy and it looks like they're 3D printed and now they're, I guess, parametric design is like the only way to do that, right? Exactly, exactly. That's the, that's the tool. So you see these Adidas uh, craft car, uh, shoes or uh, Nike that they have the spongy, they're all 3D printed and they are all parametric. And I have friends working in Nike and Adidas as well, which they use computational powers, computational tools to calculate those stuff, to calculate those spongy under the footwears. So we did a competition to find an intern for Nike as well. Like uh, it's, it's fascinating. And we have a guy from Nike and our, in our conference who's called Michael Pryor, who will be present a couple of tutorials and will talk about his profession. Uh, he, he's an architect, but he, cho he, he, he switched from architecture world to be a Nike computational designer. Wow. Yeah. I've seen a couple companies where people started as architects and then they uh, get involved in some kind of 3D printing or some other technology. I guess a lot of the things you learn for big scale stuff also applies to like all kinds of different fields where they can add tremendous value. I mean, I guess it's exactly. just a certain type of creative person that wants to become an architect. Like most people don't go into architecture trying to like copy what everyone else has done. I think a lot of people want to be creative and they want to like kind of do something new. And so I guess the people who are wise enough to catch on to the new technologies can really harness the power of, like where all the technology has gotten us today. Exactly, exactly. You, you need to be able to see these opportunities, actually. If you, if you study as, as an architect, you can go as a, in a computational design to a shoe company or a car company or a facade company or jewelry company as well. Like these are the opportunities, these are the powers of the new tools that enables you to go from architecture to other disciplines as well. Yeah. So 
how when is your webinar uh, the the conference is on 13th and 14th of Ju June. And how it's can people... Day, it's a two-day online conference uh, with Global Frontiers. We are four partners now. We're Sushant Varma from, in, from India, who's the founder of Rats Lab. Uh, Arturo Tedeschi from Milan, Italy, who's the founder of uh, Arturo Tedeschi Consultant and uh, author of Algorithms Aided Design, author of three our parametric books, and we have Michael Pryor, who's uh, the founder of Design Morphine, and he's an architect, and he is working as a Ni at Nike as a computational designer. So it's just four of us. Uh, we have two tutorials in this conference. We have uh, live mentorships. We have discussions, panel discussions, interviews, and it's two days, six points, six hours a day makes like 13 hours in two days. Uh, so will that can, be available afterwards, like a recording of it? Totally, completely. And you, you, will give, you will be given a password. And with that password, you are able to watch all those recorded videos as well. So it's a it's really great opportunity to learn about new stuff in this conference. And uh, I'm sure every, everyone will be uh, gets uh, a lot of benefits from this conference. So, so how just, do people get the password? So just go to our website and uh, re register from that button. You'll need to complete the Google form. Then after, the, uh, after that, you need to make the payments. Then we will send the passwords uh, after the payments. Cool. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So if anybody is interested, they, they can just reach us. I can say, share the information with them or they can just go to the parametric-architecture.com uh, under the uh, events tab uh, or workshops tab. You can see the uh, computational design next conference. So all the informations are there. Till now, 300 people are just registered from 56 countries. So it's just in the go. We'll see. How much is the payment? Sorry? How much is the payment? Uh, the early bird stage was 38 euros. Now it's 36, uh, 63 euros. We should have done the call during the early stage. It's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's okay. We're just re uh, getting a lot of uh, registrations as well. Like. Uh, we aimed for 500, now it's 300. So maybe till the end of the registration, we will fill up all the seats. Yeah, that would be great. Is there yeah. a limit on how many seats you can have? Uh, for now, it's 500. It's, it, if it just extends from 500, we can extend it to 1,000 as well. Uh, so it's like a scalable platform. Yes, a click meeting platform uh, is a normal webinar platform. Uh, it can be also used for conferences, meetings. So we did we choose Click Meeting because it 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 secures the uh, all the data. It stores all the data over there, and we can provide passwords to for the for the participants, so they can watch later as well. So it's it's a really great platform. Do you think you'd be able to? do many of these in like a year like do you think this is going to be something that you continue to organize yes yes we we, we are planning to do it once in two months so every two months and this is the first batch and the second or third batch we will invite other architects other designers as well from zahadid i don't know from uh, even topics about 3d printing and robotic constructions we will bring people in to discuss a little bit about these technologies and about the opportunities or maybe tutorials as well. Yeah, really cool. Really cool. So it's like an yeah, online learning you. platform at an yeah, affordable thank you. price. Exactly. Yeah, it, actually 38 euro is nothing. It's normally it's the fee of two hours webinars, two hours online webinars. So for 14 hours, you're paying for 38 euros, which is now 63 euros. It's just, imagine uh, you're paying for 
the, the money of four hours for two days. Yeah, that's great. And especially um, since people paid money for it, there's a higher chance that they're going to like be really engaged with the content um, and it should be a really captive audience for you. Exactly, exactly. Uh, that's a great opportunity for, for us as well to like uh, share these information and knowledges about uh, uh, this discipline. Have you built like a big email list at this point? Uh, to do for like sending emails to come yeah, to yeah. join? A big, yes, we did a couple of times. Yeah, just continue, sure. Yeah, we did a couple of shout outs and emailing the people uh, in US, uh, other partners as well, I did a couple of times. Uh, we'll continue to email soon as well. Every week I send emails. Uh, We'll, we'll email in the upcoming weeks as well. Is that like comparatively a good way to reach your audience? Like, is it easier for you to get in touch with people through their, through mass email or just by posting on Instagram or? No, I think it's not practical to use emails uh, these days. It's just a figure. Like if you are, if you're a company, you know, you need to de do emailing. And the rate of the open rate of the emailing is now like 20% or 15%. If you're lucky, if you're unlucky, it's, it just drops down to 10%. And the maximum that number I heard is 30%. But on Instagram, you post like, you post on Instagram stories and 30,000 people just sees that story. Or you post it on as a post, just like a, a hundred thousand people just sees that post and the chance that you can get from those on, on, on Instagram is very high from these emailing lists. And I've checked, that's actually a marketing strategy, strategy. You need to do all, all of them, but the ROI of doing it on Instagram versus emailing is, is Instagram is the top priority. And well, till now, we got 70% of the registrations from Instagram, 14% uh, from Facebook, uh, I think 10% uh, from LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, websites, other platforms as well. From emails, so, yeah, we got like, uh, I think, 5 6%. So YouTube is not really a big platform for you guys right now? Uh, not now because YouTube is actually a video platform, video format platform, and video takes time to produce actually. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to give such a shout out for these kind of conferences, you need to build videos and make the shout outs. And I don't have large amount of uh, subscribers on YouTube. Like it's just 4K, 4,000 subscribers. But if it was like a 100,000 subscriber, I would use YouTube platforms as well. Yeah, most of the content that I do is um, video content. I guess that's the content I like to make the most. I've done a lot of like writing and I've even, I found that I can write a lot with speech to text. So sometimes if I have a long drive or something, I'll just uh, have my laptop open next to me and I'll like write an article just talking to my laptop while I'm, uh, while I'm driving or something. Um, but for me, like video is the, is the platform that I've been able to connect with the most people. And um, I guess it kind of started, I was in China and I got in touch with Winsun 3D, which is a 3D printed construction company there. And they, uh, for $30, they said I could do a tour of their facility. So I showed up in like, it was just one guy in the office there and he let me just walk around with my camera the whole time. So I did just like a bunch of video. I had never really done it before. Um, but when I posted it on YouTube, initially it was like getting like two views a day. And I was like, Oh my God, two people are watching it every day. That's crazy. <laughs> um, and then it just kind of like grew, I guess the YouTube algorithm kind of caught on to it. And now like that one video could get like 50 or a hundred views in a day. And I posted it like so many months ago. Uh, I guess video for me is just like, is the best way that I've found to be able to like communicate with people. I'm hoping to do more of the like 
the videos where I'm actually on site at the with the like printer or with what it's been printing those are much more like exciting and engaging for like the average person like long conversations like this are great for people who know about the industry and they like want to have a deeper dive into like the information but the majority of people just want something like 10 minutes they can quickly just like enjoy um something more like lighthearted and fun i guess i'm hoping yeah to do a lot more uh videos like that but also this kind of content i love doing because it like allows me to speak with experts like these conversations are pretty fun for me because it's something i'm interested in and i guess like i don't know how you and i would have ever had this conversation otherwise if it wasn't like zoom being recorded so it's just like a really cool uh it's really cool how it keeps growing i wonder exactly you've published yours as podcasts on different platforms Yes, uh, I published like uh, all the interviews I, on YouTube. Then I, I started podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Google Podcast as well. So it's the voice version of uh, those videos. Till now, one, one episode is published out of those uh, 20 interviews. But I will continue to update all those interviews as well. Yeah, I'm just trying to like get started in that. Um, I use some posting platform calls like Buzzsprout uh, mm -hmm. for the MP4 file, but Apple's podcast didn't like the the title that I'm or the screen like the image that I selected, and I thought that I had it in their settings, which was like 1400 by 1400 to 3000 by 3000 pixels or whatever. But I don't know for some reason it got rejected. So. I'm trying to figure out how I can get like the artwork to work for them so I can post it. <laughs> yeah, actually you can, for podcasts, you can use Anchor. It's the best platform, I think. And it's, it doesn't charge for you to post on uh, other platforms. Uh, for hosting, I use Anchor. And from Anchor, you just post at Anchor. It just up updates to other links as well. So it's a URL you get from uh, anchor you paste it to other platforms when you update those url url feed uh, it just automatically updates on apple and google and spotify and soundcloud as well so yeah i I'll think anchor is the best that. platform yeah but sprout was not working well for me i'll try anchor um do you know if it's it's free to upload as many podcasts as you want it has a certain amount of limit for weekly uploads, I think. I'm not sure about the numbers uh, I read, but uh, it's free. It doesn't have any charge. Like, it, it doesn't have any fee to upload. Yeah, that's great. I'm really interested to see, like, how, uh, how those podcast platforms perform. Every organization has different algorithms for how they, like, show content to users. So. Um, yeah, I'm excited to like kind of venture into a new one. Um, sure. Exactly. I guess you've you need only to got go. your first you one. You need to on go and do it. You've only got your first podcast on your uh, uploaded to Spotify and Apple and Google. Yes, yes, uh, but we're trying to upload other other ones as well because uh, I really like voice. With voice, you can do a lot of stuff. You can cook, you can go, you can clean your house, you can work even. But video is not the format that you can, you can listen to the video while cooking. You can listen to the video while working. Yeah. But you don't have always opportunity or chance to watch the video. Uh, you're walking outside, you can't watch the video, but you can listen to the podcast. So I think the podcast... Podcast is really great and big thing that every media company should be involved as well. Yeah, how have like how have the results been since you? How long ago did you post the first one? It's been like three weeks, I I think, and because we started quite new, and uh, it's three weeks we published the first podcast. It just it just has three hundred or two hundred and fifty views we're brand new on <laughs> podcast industry <laughs> yeah i'm sure there's gonna like of course be a learning curve i couldn't even get mine up yet so <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're much further along than i am and uh, yeah do you plan on promoting that podcast on your like various platforms and trying to like get people yes on 
I do, I do promote on uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, not LinkedIn till now, but I did on Instagram, Facebook for a couple of times. I do one, I promote one podcast multiple times, like twice a week or once a week, uh, like randomly I publish them to listen. Yeah. It is a lot of, uh, like the publishing to the various websites and like putting in the password and like so many different accounts and passwords and stuff. And like, that's definitely the boring part of the job, but it's like, it's got to get done. It's still important. Um, I wish I could just yeah. like have a conversation using, like this in an auto post or something. Actually for those passwords, I'm using Kaspersky pass, password manager because I have thousands of passwords over there. I'm storing on the cloud. Yeah. So every time I need to access for my emails even or for social media accounts, I just copy the password. I don't know what is the password actually. I just copy and paste it to use it. Yeah, that's a good method. I have like a like a notes page right now that I just like put all the passwords in. They're all I only have so many variations, but like still I like every other time I have to reset the password or something. I forget to record it. I don't know. Oh. That's Account a management. really boring process. It's so boring. But, uh, you know, it's what you got to do to get to the finish line, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Do you have any, uh, like, scheduled interviews coming up? Yes. Uh, tomorrow I have met with Michael Rochkind. Michelle Rochkind. I don't know. It's not Michael. Michelle Rochkind from Mexico. He's the, the, he's the founder of Rochkind Architectos, and he's the president of WeWork. Uh, on Wednesday, we have uh, with James uh, from the president of uh, Tom Pedersen Fox. Wait, you said uh, the president I'm, of WeWork? Yes. Uh, let me see. Like the big public company WeWork? Yes. Wow, that'll be really cool. Vice President, it's, it's written actually double, VP, Vice President Ground Up Architecture at WeWork. Cool. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, actually after 23 hours uh, on Instagram, on our Instagram page, then on Wednesday with Competers and Fox, on uh, Thursday we have with, with a Turkish architect who's, who's called Melika Altanışık, uh, who's used to work for Zahadit for six years. He's quite popular in this region as well. On uh, Monday, we have with, uh, on Tuesday, next Tuesday, we have with Hanif Kara. I, I'm sure you know about his name, AKT2. He's the structural engineer for most of the uh, architecture buildings uh, of uh, Bjark Engels, uh, Hadid Architects. So he's a really top name. Yeah. And on 28th of May, we have Mario Carpo. Then it just goes on like this. There are a couple of uh, other interviews as well, but they are not confirmed yet. I will publish them soon as well. Yeah, sure. So you guys have seven that you've done already, right? And you have, that's even like, five or six that you have planned coming up no till now we have done let me say 15 online interviews like live interviews on yeah. instagram and uh, five about to come confirmed uh the others are not confirmed yet like three four so you guys have really ramped up the <laughs> production it sounds like yeah yeah thank you it's great actually it just gives us energy yeah that's really cool i'm sure uh within the next few years maybe you'll get to that big like one million number on instagram that's always a really exciting <laughs> goal you. and you're thank halfway you, there you. you know and it's like yeah we're already half a million and Maybe next year we could be we could be a million as well. And then it's crazy at that point because you have to shift your goals to be like from one million to ten million. <laughs> yeah, actually the numbers are not important. The 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 activity or the things that you do is more important than those yeah. numbers. And the, 
uh, and all my effort was try to publish the information and become a platform, not just an Instagram page. That, that's why I have like, I am in LinkedIn, I am in uh, Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, Snapchat, even TikTok. So it just gave me the ability to be a platform. Yeah, I think that shows in what you said earlier, like you would rather have a big impact on one person's life than just like get a million likes or something like that. Exactly. A hundred percent true. And I'm really looking forward for that one person. If it is two, I'm lucky. <laughs> well, hopefully, I think it's probably already been one person. Uh, I'm sure with that big of an audience, there's been like a ton of people who have learned things from your content or like maybe seen a job posting or something like, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, people are getting educated from stuff like that that you're sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Appreciate that. So moving okay. forward, your primary yeah. concentration is going to be doing more one-on-one -on -one interviews, hosting more panels. Uh, what other kind of like directions are you taking? Yeah, currently we're just looking for the conf to make these conferences and online education and to do more interviews as well. But other than that, for long-term uh, purpose, for long-term goals, I'm trying to uh, move all these attention on the website, Parametric Architecture, which we, we don't have really good website. Uh, we have daily visits like, uh, like 30,000 monthly or 40,000 monthly visits. But I'm trying to push for, push it, push the forward the website visitors as well to create content on the website as well and uh, to collect all those attention from platforms social media platforms in one point to the website so we'll see what happens we'll see how we yeah, can yeah that's do a hard this. challenge um, it is so where does most of the website traffic originate from it's from social media so not the, from Google, not from like, uh, like, like Yandex or any other in search engines. It's from our social media platforms, channels. Yeah, it almost seems like their algorithms are like kind of overpowering Google and the stuff that gets the most like views and shares and engagement on social media. I mean, maybe Google's even using that as uh, to decide how things rank. Yeah, uh, this SEO stuff, or I don't really understand. <laughs> uh, I have an IT guy. I have a, a developer guy, actually, who's helping us at some points. But they are really comp complicated topics, complicated stuff. You need to work with a team of uh, developers to rank, to go up in the ranking of Alexa or even in Google. So it's hard process to be, it's not the Instagram page or it's not about the Facebook page. Uh, working daily with website is quite time consuming and quite tough. Yeah, it's like what you really want to do, like the meat of the job is like learning more about like cutting edge stuff and design. But in order to like get to the meat, you got to eat your vegetables first and like learn the kind of like boring stuff and uh, yeah, like posting exactly. different platforms and like becoming a marketing expert almost, even though you don't have any passion for marketing, you really just are like, you're passionate about the technology. Exactly. That's a hundred percent true. Uh, our website is a bit different than uh, channels. So do you design the website yourself? No, no, I didn't design. I just used the, those temple, templates, WordPress templates. Sure, but you used uh, our, the, like you built it by yourself with a template. No, 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 we had a developer guy uh, ah. who helped us, yeah. Yeah, but, that's, uh, I'm sure that was like a big help. My yeah, template uh, that I uh, used is like so basic. It's just like the most simple blog. It's good to have like a start, but... um certainly down the line i'll need to kind of like improve the website 
Yes, mine was like parametric architecture was two years ago, and I'm these days looking for upgrading it to a new version, like a new style, a new look. So I'm working on it actually. Yeah, your website looks good. Like it doesn't look outdated or anything. Um, yeah, uh, it needs to be a bit more professional than this because at at the first stages, like in 2018, I published, I established this, uh, I launched this website. It was just for basic needs, like to publish some projects, to publish my own workshops, interviews, this stuff. But now it just grows and there's new needs that I need to add to the website, new requirements, uh, like uh, a lot of things. But this template or this look or this design doesn't have uh, those capabilities so i need to renew it so these are the things that really challenges the website <laughs> so when you the your website has like the books links and the interviews links um i guess let me click on one of the book ones yeah books are not just updated uh, for a long time but interviews, like articles, projects, they're all updating like weekly. Oh, so then you have the Amazon link that goes to the book. Yes, and yes, Amazon links. That's like an affiliate link. Yes, yes, it is, totally. So is that kind of like a, how do you, I make an audience for something like 3D printing construction profitable? Is, it, is that like one of the best strategies? is to do like affiliate links or is it best to like cast a wide net and use a bunch of different strategies? Actually, uh, um, Amazon affiliate links doesn't work much for architecture. If you're uh, working to like, uh, if your topic is something general, uh, Amazon works really well. For example, buying a camera, buying a watch, buying a cell phone, buying or anything in general that everybody can need it. Everybody needs it. Uh, Amazon works really good. Affiliate marketing really works good. But if you're looking for, if you want to, if you want to publish a book or a 3D printing, not everybody is looking to buy a 3D printing or 3D printer. Not everybody is looking for to buy that book or you need to have a hundred or 200, 300 of styles of the books. So you can make a good income with those affiliate marketings and you need to publish them vastly. You need to have a great audience. So affiliate marketing is not, uh, has not just got my attention to, to continue with it, but definitely you can create you, I haven't never think about how uh, how uh, I can get more like affiliate marketing in architecture or even 3D printing, but there are I, I'm sure there are opportunities to uh, to to discuss a little bit about them. Yeah, definitely, it's really cool. Um, just like kind of the power of the internet and connecting people and like how much value there is in uh, stuff that you can accomplish from your computer. Exactly, 100%. So you just create the affiliate and uh, you put the link out there and maybe someone just clicks the, on that link and goes from your special code to buy something else, not that book even. So if they buy something, from that link, it just gives you the affiliate commission. Interesting. Yeah. But that's not like anything. a full-time solution. Yeah, if they buy anything from that link that you put there, so you put a book link, they go to the book web page, and they buy another thing. For example, they buy a camera, they buy grocery. So you get the commission from that buy, from that purchase. Yeah, it's nice now that you have it all set up, kind of like, I guess setting it up is the hard part. And now you can just add books when you find good ones. And exactly. Uh, you got a big like system already kind of put in place. Exactly, exactly. It's figuring, it's figuring it out is the hardest part after you did it. 
So you can really speed up and do a lot of things. Yeah. So you've become like a jack of all trades. Uh, exactly. In order to exactly. pursue one. That's right. So uh, how many times we have? Like, are we closing to end or? Because we I can. need to... Uh, in 10 minutes to call someone someone that's fine uh, so do you have any like closing remarks that you'd like to make actually to, as a closer i would like to just make some advices for maybe younger generation i'm still young as well like i'm 30 years old not uh, in the position to give advice but i can just advise younger generation who are trying to find their niche or are trying to figure a way out to uh, get things done or uh, try to find their brands or these kind of stuff. Just uh, invest on in your time and try to learn new stuff, learn new things and don't waste your time. Don't waste your time by watching on netflix or all those series or all those movies your time is now valuable valuable and you will understand it after 30 you will understand it after 10 years 20 years after you invest your in your time in a, in a brand or anything that you're building for five years or six years 10 years after that 10 years you will see the result actually that was that would be my best advice for younger generation as a closer actually that's great advice and i think that not only does it help the younger generation but there's also some some older people who might be kind of stuck in their ways and not haven't branched out to try something new uh maybe they could find some value in actually exactly a hundred percent for for anybody who's chasing anything that would be a great opportunity to invest on their times to reach anything that they want well, it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, maybe Thank down you. the line, we'll definitely stay in touch. Maybe we can uh, do another update in the future. Sure, sure, sure. I'm always here. Just send me a message. I'm online. I'm free. I can, we can sh schedule out uh, to, to speak again. Great. And I hope, your, uh, I hope your upcoming webinar goes really well. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks to, for this invitation and thanks for the conversation. The questions were really great. The conversation was really great. Uh, looking forward to, these kind, to make these kind of interviews as well in the, in the future. Thank you. All right. Well, good luck with whatever you're doing next. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day as well.